So let's go. We're going to go uh, verses 38 through 42. So let's read these. Uh, I'll be in the NASB 1995 uh, for the entirety of the evening. And it says, this is Jesus speaking. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So this is uh, this is one of those the, those sections of verses that um, get a few different interpretations, and um, it's one of those ones too where I think our human nature really kind of pops out because you hear something like if someone slaps you on the cheek, give him the other one, and most of us are like, nah, not going to do that. Um, you know, if they sue you for your shirt, give them your coat also, you know, if someone forces you to go a mile with them, uh, go with them to go an extra mile. That's kind of where that phrase comes from, by the way. Um, so with it, right. And, and again, if you, if you remember the, the order of how things went, Jesus starts with the Beatitudes. So he says, this is the quality and characteristics of Christian living. And he lays out these absolutely impossible standards. And then he tells us, okay, you need to live by these standards because you need to be salt and light in this world. And then he starts challenging the very lessons that these people had grew up hearing and learning. And, you know, you've heard it said, you shall, you shall not murder. And I'm telling you, I don't even want you to be angry with one another. Uh, you've heard, do not commit adultery. I'm going to tell you that you shouldn't even look at another person with lust, and so on and so on. So we have these things. You've heard, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so Jesus kind of breaks these down. And like I like to remind everyone every week, that Jesus is not criticizing the law. He's not coming in. And he's not changing Old Testament law. The criticism is coming towards the way the law has been taught and the way the, the law um, has kind of been mishandled and, and forced upon the Jewish people. So Jesus says himself, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So again, Jesus is not coming in and criticizing and doing away with old law. He is just um, sharing it in its fullest intention, right? Right? So this law, the law that we're going to look at in particular, he says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Um, the, the audience that he's talking to is very, very familiar with this law in particular because it is addressed in every book that has law in it. So um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I want to show you three of the examples because the one in Numbers doesn't quote it directly but it definitely has to do with the subject matter. So let's look at Exodus uh, 20, 23 through 24. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Pretty straightforward, pretty fair, right? Um, if you were to cause injury to somebody else, then you yourself will be injured, right? That's kind of... Uh, that would be a very human idea of what justice is, right? In Leviticus, it says, If a man injures his neighbor, just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he has injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. This is the basically the exact same statement, right? And in Deuteronomy, we also read, Thus you shall not show pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. So the problem that's being addressed, right, by Jesus is that the Pharisees and the lawgivers had treated matters of human relationships as court or legal matters. So what we need to understand about these verses, right, life for life, foot for foot, hand for hand, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever is done to you, you shall also do to them, that kind of a thing, right? 
And in the greater context, right, these are legal matters, legal matters to be handled by the court. The problem is that the Pharisees have incorporated this legal approach to human relationships, right? So, for instance, if I borrow something from you, let's say uh, something that you like. Let's say I, I, I need your, uh, your laptop for the day. And, you know, I take it to a coffee shop and I spill on it or something like that, right? Your immediate reaction, well, I should say the, the way that once you process what has happened, it's not like you're going to come to my house and be like, all right, uh, where are your guitars? Where's your, you know, where's your computer, right? Because the way that we handle human relationships is very different than the way we would handle court and legal matters. And I think this is one of the, the issues, and I, this is why Jesus is addressing this, because we also try to handle legal matters as human relationships, right? And so there is a distinct line between all of these. And so human relationships require mercy. The way that we need to act amongst one another, um, you know, we need to be peaceable with one another. We need to have mercy upon one another. We've gone through a number of scriptures just in the Sermon on the Mount that has to do with that. And so human relationships require mercy, and the courts require justice. So that's the distinction that we need to make. Human relationships, the way that we interact with one another, requires mercy, and the courts require justice. If we lived our entire lives according to justice, then every time we get hurt, we would hurt somebody back, right? And, I mean, you're taught at a very young age that you just don't do that, right? So, you have heard that it was said, an eye for eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek to him also. Now, the interesting thing about this and, and what this is not saying, okay? What this is not saying is uh, take your beating and move on, Okay? This is not an open invitation to just be another person's doormat, okay? Because right here, the underlined phrase, the phrase that I have underlined, do not resist an evil person, has caused a lot of trouble for a lot of Christians because it leads you to believe that anyone who acts unjustly towards you or unfairly or unmerciful, that you're supposed to just take the brunt of it, right? And that isn't entirely the case. We are allowed to and even called to resist evil. And there are a number of scriptures to back this up. And we're going to break this down too. Because again, you know, if we believe that the word of God is inerrant and infallible, then it cannot contradict itself and it does not contradict itself. So let's build this case. All right. So right here we see do not resist an evil person. But again, this does not mean that you do not resist evil. For instance, we see in James 4, 7, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Is the devil evil? Yes, so it's basically telling us resist evil. Okay? 1 Peter 5, 9, But resist him, this is of course addressing uh, uh, the devil or, or an evil person, but resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Okay, Paul, in his letter to the church in, in Galatia, right? So in Galatians, we have this little bit of Paul. But when Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas is Peter, the apostle Peter, right? So the Peter from the 12 disciples, okay? But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Paul got into Peter's face because he stood condemned. Peter had done something that Paul didn't agree with, that he didn't think was right, so he resisted him, okay? 1 Corinthians 5.11, But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person. That right there, an example of resistance towards an immoral person. Or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Right? Again, we have another example of resisting an evil person. 
1 Timothy 5.20 tells us those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all. So don't just rebuke them, rebuke them publicly so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. Right? These are like church guidelines of the early church, which is kind of interesting. Um, and so again, this is Paul writing it. And if you're one of those people who like, I like Jesus more than Paul. Okay, here's what Jesus says in Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. If you understand the context of what it means to be a Gentile and a tax collector in first century Israel, then this is a big, big deal, right? Essentially, this is what we would call excommunication today, is tell the church, and if he doesn't listen to the church, then they're out. They can't fellowship, they can't come and and be a part of the service, and that kind of a thing. And so this is Jesus' idea of what today we would call church discipline. That is actually the perfect outline for how church discipline should work. But the point of going through all of these verses, again, is to show that just because it says, do not resist an evil person, it does not mean that you are to just lay back and become, you know, a, again, a doormat. This is the, the best phrase that I have for it. So here we go. Let's take a look at it again. So this is the first part of verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist, resist underlined, and an evil person. Now what we have here in the original Greek and in the language that this was written, so this first, this top word here, to resist, right, is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, but anyways, that's Greek, and it means to resist or to set against, okay? And then the next phrase underneath it, uh, to panero, which is the evil person, right? So to set against an evil person, which basically is... What that tells us is do not start a feud. Do not retaliate for the sake of retaliation. Don't just um, react angrily, right? Don't, you know, anytime anything, you know, unjust happens towards us or what, what we consider unfair, right? The initial reaction is, oh, I'm going to get them. And then uh, depending on how good you are at holding grudges, you'll, you'll wait it out and you'll find the good time. You'll find the perfect time. Oh, I'm going to get them when I do this or, oh, we're hanging out this weekend. So I'm going to do, you know, or whatever. Right. And basically what's being stated there is that do not do that. Do not set out to start a feud with a person. Okay. So are we clear on that? So, okay. And then the second half of the verse, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. So, this right here is kind of interesting in the fact that Jesus is being very specific when he says the right cheek, okay? Now, what that tells us is a couple things, is that, one, a majority of people are right-handed, correct? Okay, now, if I am right-handed, and I am, and I'm going to slap someone on the right cheek, how do I do that? backhanded backhanded and a lot of us already know in the ancient world and also today to backhand someone is a sign of extreme disrespect right that's actually where the term backhanded compliment comes from right when you backhand someone it's very disrespectful and very critical of who they are so jesus could be talking about a couple things here right he could be talking about a literal slap a backhanded slap, or you could think of it as an insult. That you will be insulted anytime you take, um, you can take insults, you could take uh, physical harm and things like that. So that's why he says it that way, because again, like, like all the verses before this, right? They know, okay, don't murder. And Jesus says, no, 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 don't, don't just not murder each other. 
don't even be angry. And they're like, okay, don't commit adultery. No, no, no. Don't just not commit adultery. Do not look at one another in lust. And so don't, it, he's saying it's not just the physical harm. It's as small as an insult or disrespect towards you to turn the other to him also. And the thing about this, right, we're going to look at two examples in scripture of people actually getting beat. Uh, there's a lot of beating in the Bible. Uh, so, but before we get to that, that verse in and of itself, right, creates a lot of problems for us because all of us, just about all of us, want to retaliate in any form, whether it's physical or uh, verbal, right? Anything that happens to us, our natural inclination is retaliation, which again, which what that does is it just affirms to us our human sinful condition, right? Because what Jesus is asking of us is to, resi- to not resist the evil person in the sense that we do not want to start feuds. We don't want to go after people because of the way they've acted towards us. But that goes against our very being, right? That goes against every like every instinctual thing that we have, right? Because a lot of us have been hurt. A lot of us have been either hit or verbally abused. And a lot of us uh, grow up either knowing how to fight back or knowing how to talk back because of those very things. So Paul uh, in Acts, so I'm going to be reading the first five verses of Acts chapter 23, uh, if you guys want to turn there. But some backstory of what's going on here. Paul had just been arrested, um, uh, preaching the gospel, and that was a big no-no. And he's he's been arrested, and he's being confronted, uh, interrogated by uh, some of the authorities and, and, and the priests and whatnot. And so that's kind of what's happening there. So Acts 23, 1, Paul, looking intently at the council, so again, he's being interrogated, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God, up to this day, meaning Paul is saying, I don't know what's going on, but I don't think I've done anything wrong. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. So Paul is being interrogated. He's been in prison for a while now. They take him to the council, and Paul's like, I don't know what's going on. I haven't done anything wrong. Ananias, not the same Ananias that you guys are familiar with, not Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias is a different Ananias, in case you guys were confused by that. These are different people. If you don't know who either of them is, then ignore that last sentence. So um, Ananias commanded them to strike him in the mouth, and the way uh, it reads in the Greek is punch. They, They punch this dude in the mouth, okay? Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation the law uh, in violation of the law order me to be struck? Okay, so Paul obviously reacts like how we would react. Now whitewashed wall. Um yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I've completely forgotten what that means, but that's that's a a um a very low um insult. Uh, whitewashed tombs. Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs at some point uh, in the New Testament. And um, yeah, it's just, it's basically a total lack of character. You have no integrity. You're a hypocrite. You're awful. It's like all, all of these insults kind of summed up into one simple phrase, being whitewashed, right? You whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law? So he just he just retaliates, which is how most of us would be, right? Imagine, if you will, um, you get called to the principal's office or your boss's office, and all you do is sit down and go, "Look, you know, I'm a, I've been pretty good. Uh, I don't know what's going on." And then, boom, they just punch you right in the mouth, <laughs> right? A lot of us would probably react very similar to this and in less churchy language. So. Um, But the bystanders, right, the bystanders go, do you revile God's high priest? So um, Ananias is the high priest at the time, and he's the one that has them punch Paul. And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was the high priest. 
For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So, Paul is apologizing here. Because he understands what the law states, what the law states about how you're supposed to treat the priest. So, the priest is acting extremely unjustly towards Paul. Has him decked in the mouth. And Paul just retaliates, right? And then they're like, hold on, Paul. That's the high priest. And Paul's like, oh, God, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. Now, not all of us would be so generous, right? But think about that. Because Paul knows the law so well, and he understands the conduct that is required of him as, as he himself living a, a godly life. And so he goes, Look, if I knew that I was a high priest, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have said those horrible things because I know what the law says. You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Right? So if you, if you remember what we talked about last week, right, where we live our lives according to let our yeses be yeses and let our noes be noes, right? We're not making oaths in the sense that just be an honest person, right? To sum up what we went over last week, is driving home the point. Just live your lives in an honest manner. And if that is the case, right? So let's say, um, let's tone it down. And let's say it's not a, you're not getting beat up by people, but people are talking bad about you. They're stirring up gossip. They're talking a bunch of mess, whatever it is, right? And normally we like to get mixed up in things like that. And Jesus in these verses is telling us not to retaliate. Now, if you think about, if you're living your life as an honest person, your yeses are yeses, your noes are noes, then there's no need to retaliate because, right, there is no ground for these slanders against you to stand, right? If you're a person of integrity and you live your life with integrity, uh, being holy and blameless and all these things that we're called to live, then all of these insults against you, all of this gossip against you, should be untrue. And the truth will win out in the end, right? And so what you do is, essentially, you're offering the other cheek. There's no need. There's no need to retaliate. There's no need to get back at anybody because if we are living holy and blameless lives, then eventually people will figure out, oh, that person's holy and blameless. Whatever so-and-so said about them is obviously not true, right? Okay, so another example of this, which is perfect timing, right? Because we had just spent uh, all of last week um, focusing and, and remembering and meditating on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so here's Jesus um, before the council. And Jesus is asking, why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. So this is the, the priests and uh, the Pharisees questioning Jesus. And Jesus said, why do you question me? Just question the people who he have heard what I have said. right? Because again, if you guys remember, he's being arrested for blaspheming and calling himself to be God. And they're like, are you God? And he's like, why are you asking me? Ask the people that I spoke to. So when he said this, when Jesus said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? This is almost, right, almost note for note, the same situation that Paul finds himself. Of course, Paul's situation is years after this one. He says, Jesus answered him, if I've spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? Meaning Jesus said, okay, if I've done anything wrong, Tell me what I've done wrong. But if I haven't done anything wrong, why are you hitting me? He doesn't retaliate. He just reasons with them. Right? That's all Jesus is doing. And you, you have to also remember, this is after he's been flogged, he's been beaten, hitting with sticks and beat up, and he's already taken all sorts of beatings, right? And so he gets hit again by the high priest, and he says, look, if I've done anything wrong, you just tell me. And if I haven't done anything wrong, then what are you doing? And just leaves it at that, right? Two very different contrasts, right? One, 
is someone acting out of their human nature and one, a more Christ-like nature because it is Christ, right? And so these verses, the ones in Matthew 38 through 42, are the analogies that Jesus gives throughout all of them are going to outline four things. So every analogy touches on something, and it's one, it's it's a, something that each of us has to deal with, or or um, things that we kind of hold sacred. And they are as follows: they are dignity, security, liberty, and property. Right? These are four very foundational things. And if you've grown up in America long enough, you understand the importance of these four things: dignity, security, liberty, and property. Okay, so dignity. We've we've gone over this verse for most of the nights. It says, "But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek again, that is an insult. That is backhanded. Turn the other to him also." So, any time that your dignity is challenged, there is no need to retaliate, because again, if we are living holy and blameless lives and we're living according to the ways that God has called us to live, then these insults and these gossips, and even physical harm will not prove our guilt in the sense that people will figure out, again, if we live our lives with integrity, they will figure out, okay, that person has integrity, so obviously that person is acting unjustly, okay? Security. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. So this is an interesting one because here we have, again, if you're the audience hearing this and, and we're, we're reading this, if anyone wants to sue you, right? So by that, we can already infer that we have done something wrong in this scenario, right? Because we are being sued in this example. You guys following? So if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. And so what this can tell us here is, uh, first off, the coat being addressed here in these times. Um, I don't have enough time to go back into Exodus, um, but there's, um, there's a law that basically says if you let someone borrow your coat, whoever's borrowing your coat needs to have it back to you before nightfall because that is your security. That's what keeps you warm at night. Because again, these, I mean, they didn't have like the greatest houses or air conditioning and heating and all that stuff, right? So, so a cloak or your coat is their sense of security. Okay, and that's in Exodus um, 20. It's in there. It's in there. Exodus 20 something. If you guys want to go back into the Old Testament and see where, where they pull that from. So, what Jesus is addressing here, right? So, you have caused some trouble and the result of that is someone is suing you for your shirt right they're acting in the law that they've heard right eye for eye tooth for tooth whatever and they're like look man i just i just need that shirt okay and so our attitude in that situation right is i'm sorry to have caused the trouble that i have caused here's my shirt here also is my coat I'm really sorry that I wronged you. This is the attitude that Jesus is displaying in this phrase. And again, the coat is an analogy, at least for us, we're going to modernize it, is our sense of security, right? It's just one of those things that we will be called to give up at some point in our lives. Liberty. So Matthew 5.41 says, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him two. So this uh, refers to, in this time, right, Israel is under uh, Roman occupation. And there was a law that allows Romans, so let's say um, they got a bunch of stuff and they got to carry it to the capital or whatever. They can legally, this is in their law, they can legally just grab a random Jew and say, you, let's go, carry my stuff. And they have to go one mile. And the Romans were generous. It was only one mile. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but that's, that's the law that they had written, right? So, so imagine thinking this, right? 
Imagine being a Jew. You're under Roman occupation. You hate the Romans. You despise the Romans. You're aware of the law where they force you to carry stuff. The stuff that they're carrying is the stuff that keeps you in oppression and keeps you under their rule, right? And Jesus is saying, go an extra mile. That, I mean, that's tough. Um, and is because of that law, a lot of us know this story, um, when Jesus is being crucified and he falls over, they grab a guy from the crowd and they tell someone to carry Jesus' cross. It's because of that law in place that they grab Simon and say, hey, take the cross. Because they have that law, they can do that. They can force him to do that. And so what's being communicated here, right, is that, Again, let, let's put it in their terms, and then let's see if we can create an analogy here. How this deals with our liberty, if you're a Jew and you're just trying to live your life, try and do your daily thing, maybe you, you got a job to do, or you're just trying to get home, and someone says, no, 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 I need you real quick, and they force you to walk a mile, and what Jesus is saying is, go an extra mile and show them that it doesn't really bother you that much. Right, And so there are plenty of times in our lives, especially if you want to be involved in ministry or church activity or any, any of that kind of thing, we're going to want to live our lives, and we're going to need our me time and all that kind of stuff. And life, especially church life, interferes with that a lot. And we, what, what we cannot do is complain when that happens. In fact, we should put forth the extra effort, right? And now, again, in the same way, we're not being doormats for people, right? There's an understanding of what we can and cannot do. So, for instance, if you are at your wit's end and you just can't handle another task or whatever, right? Like, this is where you just have to be honest with yourself, right? You can't just... Because a lot of people, the issue with them is they don't know how to tell people no, and that's why they're in the position that they're in, you know, and they're worn out and exhausted and burnt out, as we like to say in church words, and all these kinds of things, right? So that, that's a, a separate problem on, all on its own. But when you have the capacity, and you will have to give up some of your freedom, some of your liberty to live a Christian life, and y'all need to be extremely grateful that y'all live where you live, because the liberties that are being trampled upon for our brothers and sisters on the other side of the world is you guys could not fathom what those people are going through. And this life will cause you, will require you to let go of some freedom every now and again. And when that does come, do, do your best. Do your best. And property. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So again, you know, the issue with this, right? If you, if you took this extremely literally and you didn't think it through and didn't reason, right? And let's say you wanted to, you're driving downtown and you started here. So let's say Barker, Cypress, and I-10. And you're not going to get onto I-10. You're going to ride the feeder road. And every time there's a beggar at the stoplight, you, gave, you, ha you just gave the money because this verse tells you that you're supposed to do that, right? You'll be broke before you get to downtown, right? So obviously, you can't just give things away all willy-nilly and, you know, and because you don't know who's asking for what and why they're asking for it and all this kinds of stuff. And, and there's, there's, you know, obviously there's a bunch of reasons why you don't want to just give away all your things or every time someone wants to borrow something, you have to give it to them, Right? Like, you could be smart, you can be wise, and you can be discerning. That's not what this verse is saying. But what it is telling us is that you should be generous. You should be generous. Do not be a stickler. Don't be all like, these are my things. I own them. I worked hard. And it's like, you don't own anything. It all belongs to God, right? It all belongs to God. So every now and again, yeah, you're going to have to let people borrow some stuff. You're going to have to give to someone who needs it, right? You don't give it to anyone and everyone who's asking for money. That would put us all in a lot of trouble. But what we can do 
is we know when people need something. We know when people need help. And we have the capacity to help people. And let's say not even monetarily. We should be generous with our time. We should be generous with our emotions. We should be generous with our listening. We should be generous in these manners as well. Right? It's not all material and, and monetary. There are ways for us to be generous. And so we should not turn away people who need help from us. Right? So, um, with that, let's read Romans 12, 17, 18. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Right? Don't retaliate. Don't, you guys get it. Don't, don't pay back evil for evil. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Meaning not everyone is looking for peace. But when it depends on you and when the ball is in your court, it is your job to keep the peace. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So if you're one of those guys who hate the niceties of it, at the very least, you got God's wrath. There you go. Win-win for everybody, right? If you're just so, I don't want to be nice to nobody, there you go. There's your reason to be nice right there because they'll get theirs, right? <laughs> Obviously, that is not the heart of what this message is. This is you guys are allowed to laugh at these things. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no. But again, right? Again, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of, when you think about it in these terms, right, it's very stupid for us to want revenge on anybody. Because if we understand God and his wrath and his justice and his mercy and how God plays things out, that's, yeah, we're not going to do anything more than what God is capable of doing, right? And you should also remind you, yourself, that you have escaped the wrath of God too, if you were born again. You are no better than the people who are troubling you. You are no better than the people acting unjustly towards you. You are no better than any of them. You have just come under the grace and mercy of God. So you have escaped the wrath of God, and not everyone gets that privilege. So the mere fact that, again, we are battling our human inclinations, and we have a propensity to violence, a propensity to retaliation, and we are to leave those things at the foot of the cross, and we are to sacrifice that, and understand that we have escaped the wrath of God, and we don't know everyone who will escape the wrath of God. So it's not our job to dole out wrath to people or to retaliate or seek revenge. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, right? This is one of those lessons that we learn as children. Just, there are bad people. We should just be nice to everyone and, you know, overcome evil with good. Because two, one of two things happens, right? When our lives become testimonies and people become born again because, you know, they see our good works and they want to know why we do those good works and so they seek after God because of that, right? Or the other thing happens, they have no reason to want to change. They don't want to change. They're just horrible, wretched people, you know, their whole lives. Well, then our kindness is like heaping burning coals on their head, right? These are, these are the, the, the two ends of that spectrum there. And so, to kind of sum, sum up all of it, right, we have dignity, security, liberty, and property. These are all things that will be asked of us in service to God. We will have to sacrifice one of these at some point, um, and we might have to sacrifice them often. And not everyone is a Christian. And not everyone is living a life to be holy and blameless. And so we will face our own sorts of persecution, right? And again, we should be grateful for the kind of persecution that we do come against because the persecution 
that our brothers and sisters face in other countries and other circumstances is far greater than we could probably bear. So it's not our job to retaliate. It's not our job to seek revenge. But we give of ourselves. And, and we just keep giving of ourselves. We are to be generous, peaceful, and kind, and loving. This is the life that we're called to give. Even in the face of adversity, even when people are slandering us and all these kinds of things, if we have continued to live our lives according to the way that God has called us to live them, then all of these accusations against us will just fall away, right? And let's say it it never does, right? Let's just say you just live in persecution your entire life, and your persecution is what kills you. Then you get to wake up in glory. You will get to be face to face with the Savior. And the sacrifice that he put forth and placed his righteousness upon you, because again, remember, you were no better than the people who have persecuted you. You have just come under the grace and mercy of God. And one day you'll become face to face with your Savior. And guess what? Your dignity is back. Your security is back. Your liberty is back. And property, whatever, however you want to imagine what property looks like in heaven, have at it. Because, you know, I don't have a firm grasp on that. But all the things that we sacrifice and all the things that we're going to put up with as Christians here on this earth, if you're so eager, like if your whole life is driven that you're comfortable here on earth, then you're missing the point. The goal is not here. If we cherish this life only, we are to be most pitied. In other translations, it says we are most miserable. We don't belong here. This is not our home. So all of the things that we face, we have no room to seek revenge. Because again, God's wrath will, will, uh, God's wrath will find those whom God needs his wrath to find, right? And so, um, I love what Charles uh, Charles Spurgeon said. He said this, We are to be the anvil when bad men are the hammers. Yeah. We're going to face a lot of stuff in our lives. Uh, And we'll probably face stuff from the people closest to us. We're going to have family issues, problems with our friends, uh, all, all kinds of nonsense, right? And there, there are evil people out there who just want to do evil things. And we are, we are called to be Christians, to live holy and blameless lives. We're going to let our yeses be yeses, our noes be noes. We're going to live with integrity. And even if that persecution kills us, death is our gain. We will be face to face with our Savior, living in his glory forever and ever. And so, just remember this. Abraham went back to save his nephew Lot after he had been betrayed and insulted and all kinds of stuff. Abraham still went back for Lot. Joseph forgave his brothers after they beat him nearly to death, sold him into slavery, and he was imprisoned for years. And yet, near the end of his life, he saw them again, and he still forgave them. He told them, what you guys meant for evil, God intended for good. David forgave Saul. David's ascension to the throne was something that uh, few people had ever heard of. And Saul wasn't too, too happy about that. And Saul was on a constant mission to find David and to kill David because he was was not going to let go of his throne. And yet David had found Saul in a cave, or there are actually several instances where David had the upper hand on Saul and could have killed him at any moment, and he decided not to. David forgave Saul. Stephen, who was the first martyr in church history, was being stoned, which is throwing rocks at him until he died. And he's in his prayer, 
He says, God, do not hold this crime against them. They're killing him. They're in the middle of killing him. And he prayed that the ones who murdered him were not to be punished for this particular crime. Right? Because the gospel had just started being preached. You know? They don't know what's going on. And then, we, of course, we have the words of Jesus in Luke 23, 34. And Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots and divided up his garments among themselves. So any time that we feel the need to retaliate or to get back at people, we need to always remember this. That Jesus facing, I mean, Jesus is already on the cross at this moment. He's been beaten, insulted, beaten again, whipped, interrogated. Uh, you know, the crowd has turned on him. He's wearing the crown of thorns. He's already been nailed. He's, you know, had to carry his cross. He's fallen over. He can't even make the journey all the way. He's been nailed. He's beaten, bloody. They're still insulting him. They're saying things like, if you really are God, why don't you get the angels to save you? And they're mocking him saying, aren't you the king of the Jews? And all this stuff, right? And he still takes the time to say, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And while he's saying that, they are gambling over his clothes. So, if Jesus did not retaliate, we have no need to retaliate. And the other side of that is that God is a God of justice, and his wrath will be doled out how he seems fit. Right? If we are born again, we have escaped the wrath of God. And not everyone gets that privilege. And so we will let God enact justice as he seems fit, or as he sees fit. It is not our job to take matters into our own hands in the sense of enacting our vengeance upon people. Because one, we're not going to do a better job than God when it comes to vengeance. And two, we don't know who's going to escape that wrath. So we should be eternally grateful that we have and we need to hope that those who are living evil lives escape it as well. We're to be the anvil while the bad people are to be the hammers.